You're watching Drake Queen Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hey guys, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. So if you know me on Twitter, the Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming back at you with another Let's Play episode of Supernova Super Fangs Path. So the last place we left off, we're actually just getting in the car with uh, Frank and, uh, well, Super Fang. I'm just going to call him Super Fang. <laughs> with uh, Nisus and Super Fang. Ooh, excuse me. And we're heading to the funeral. So I wonder if this is going to play out a little bit differently because I've chosen Nisus. I suppose we shall see. But anyway, guys, let's jump right back into it. Please sit back and enjoy. Let me entertain you for the next 20 minutes and let's jump right in. The oh, arm chain, you're up. And let's go. Okay. <clears throat> I discover that Nisus lives around five blocks downtown from down from Grifton. He's waiting for us in front of an old fashioned but decent looking apartment building. The fox looks a little awkward, shoulders hunched and paws in his pants pockets. He brightens up a little when the car comes to a stop at the curb. Hey, you two. For the next ten minutes, we drive in silence. I'm told the cemetery is about an hour away, just outside the southern suburbs. Nisa seems content to just gaze out the window, and Vince is focused on the road. I fidget with the buttons of my suit. So, I've been meaning to ask something. Yeah? What was Templar like, you know, as a person? Vince gives me a sideways glance. It was a hero. Through and through. Folks loved him for a reason, you know. He was brave and strong, and he loved helping people. He always did what he did with a wide grin. He pauses, then laughs. Ha! <laughs> I guess you wouldn't be able to tell with a helmet and all. But trust me, he loved doing what he did. Saving people, helping, all of it. I guess that's kind of the image to Templar I had in my head. Even if it seems a little, I don't know, boring? I turn my head to look at Frank, but he doesn't meet in my eyes, instead gazing out the window. His voice is tinged with melancholy. He had this sense of conviction with whatever he did. Like he always knew who he was and what he needed to do, no matter the situation. I really saw him hesitate, even when the circumstances were far from being black and white. Just dependable. Solid. He lets out a long sigh at the end. I sit in silence. That's a lot to live up to. Unbound said she doesn't expect me to. Well, more like she didn't think I can. It stings a little, but I guess it's up to me to try. I'm far from the steadfast, brave, heroic figure that Superfang and Nisus are describing. That Templar is dead. I'm just a shoddy substitute. I do indeed. I, d I do intend to try. I feel Nisus's paw on my shoulder. You'll be fine, Nick. Thanks, uh, f Frank. It's saying his name feels more awkward than when I do it with Superfang. I don't think he minds, though. Yeah, th at the risk of sounding cliche... You just don't know how awesome you are yet. He gives me a signature thumbs up, eliciting a chuckle from me. <laughs> I guess I'll have to trust you on that one. Yeah, put your faith in me. Heh. <laughs> oh, another thing. Yeah? Well, I still don't know what the Baron looks like, under the helmet I mean. I'll point him out to you. You don't have to talk with him today if you don't want to. No, it's fine. I think back to how many times I've seen Nisus and the Baron clash in the short time I've known them. Do you guys, like, not get along? Vince gives me a nervous glance. We're fine, mostly. He has just been a little insufferable since, you know. I don't know why, but I feel a pang of guilt in my chest, even though I know this is not my this isn't my fault. Again, don't worry about him. He'll chill out soon enough. I'm looking forward to it. He's a good person. Never said he wasn't. But ah, oh, come on, Fang. Yes, he is a good person. A good person who's sometimes a complete ass. Vince's expression falls, but he doesn't argue back. After that, Vince and I chat a little bit more about Templar. Nisus is still lost in his own thoughts. I learned that Templar's real name was Michael O'Connor, and that he was an owner of a regular pub in the city. A remarkably unremarkable occupation for someone like him to have. Not that I knew him well enough to make that judgment. It's just that famous superhero who moonlights as a bartender seems a little incongruous. By then, we're in the flat suburb south of, uh, south of Nova City. Not run down, but a stark contrast to the lavish Magnolia Hills. Small, squat houses line the narrow roads as we weave through. Something occurs to me when we turn onto the street leading up to the cemetery. Did Templar's family know about the superhero stuff? Hmm? Oh yeah, oh they all did. I don't think Shannon does, actually. That's Michael's younger daughter. Frank Co clarifies for my benefit. Really? Huh! Well, Sarah and Daddy knew for sure. Daddy was training to be the next Templar. Oh. Um, yeah. Damn. So that's Templar's son. Do they know about me? Yes, the Baron told them. 
Fuck! That's going to be awkward. Should I even talk to either of them? Seems kind of disrespectful if I didn't. Then again, would they want to talk to me? I grow more nervous as we approach our destination. Several cars are parked outside the walled entrance to the cemetery. Ben stops his, and we, sh we shuffle out onto the sidewalk. I don't spot any people. I guess everyone's already in there. The air is crisp for this time of year, even as the sh even if the sun shines overhead. As Vince goes ahead of us, I notice Frank lingering, struggling with his tie, the knot having loosened sometime during our ride. Want some help? Uh, sure. He looks awkwardly to the side while I fiddle with the tie. Dad is a stickler for a proper dress, for proper dress, so I could do this with my eyes closed. There, all good. S sorry about that. Th thanks, Nick. I give him a quizzical look. No worries. Frank looks. Frank looks at his watch. We're a bit late. Let's go. Vince is waiting for us just inside the metal gates. The cemetery is well maintained. Po is well maintained, polished stone and marble all around. As a good as good a resting place as any. Spotting the small groups that have gathered for Templar's funeral is easy with nothing but low gravestones blocking line of sight. I take note of the family of badgers at once. The middle-aged female must be Sarah, which makes the tall and broad male Danny and the young tall which makes the tall and broad male Danny and the young girl Shannon. On the approach, Frank nudges me and points to a tall albino rat sitting next to the widow, rubbing her back with slow circular motions. So that's the Baron in black. Unbound stands toward the back. It's the first time I've seen her without her mask, but since I know what to look for, recognizing her is easy enough. The three of us move to join her. The bear acknowledges our arrival with a nod. The priest, a short mouse, is reading from the scripture. I stand a bit to the side, letting the teammates mourn without me intruding. I feel out of place enough as it is. Besides the four sentinels, I don't know a single person here. I hate the thought that I was the last person who saw Templar, Mr. O'Connor, alive. Not his family, not his friends, not even his superhero teammates, but a random raccoon who just happened to be chilling in an abandoned condo in the hills. I couldn't even help him in the fight that killed him. And even then, he gave me his most valued possession. Staring at the casket that has yet to be lowered into the ground, I can't help but wonder if Templar, whoever he is now, regrets his last act. I guess it's up to me to make sure he won't. The priest finishes and Danny steps forward to deliver the eulogy. The badger is stone-faced. I imagine he is trying to his hardest to put on a stoic appearance. According to Vince, he turned 18 some months ago, and he, she, he's still a senior in high school. I can't imagine how hard this may be for him. Still, his voice doesn't crack once as he speaks of his father. I'm startled to hear Vince sniffle next to me. He looks mortified as he tries to discreetly wipe his eyes with his sleeve. He tries because his size makes it rather hard to be discreet. Not that anyone is looking at him besides me. Maybe he'd appreciate a small gesture of comfort. Comfort him. Knitting my brows, I take a quick step to the side and nudge his elbow. He flinches as if jolted and turns his face to me. Shit, he looks even more upset than I did just a moment ago. Maybe I should have just stayed in my own damn lane. I flash him an apologetic look and retreat back to where I was. I try to focus on the younger badger's words, but I can't stop sharing the, staring at the hole in the ground. My mind is blank and a faint buzzing is in my ears. I only look away when I realize Danny has finished delivering his eulogy. His younger sister is crying into her sleeve, with the Baron standing over her, paws on her shoulders. I took a quick look at Nisus and Unbound. The fox is just staring at the ground, paws in his pockets again, jaw tight. Unbound looks more composed, although there is obvious sorrow in her expression. Vince seems to have recovered and is now observing the proceedings calmly, but his tense and uncomfortable posture gives his true mood away. They begin lowering the casket. I hang back as the rest of the small crowd gets closer. Rest in peace, Templar. I don't know why you picked me for this job, but I'm going to do the, my damn best. I made up my mind about that already. They start covering the grave in dirt, and several of the attendees start wandering away, while others exchange brief words with Templar's family. The Sentinels are all there are now, too, with the Badgers. Vince gives all three a hug, his form trembling as he does so. I'm glad Templar's family has, pe has people like them around. The Baron hasn't left their side for even a moment. Again, I feel out of place. I think about just I think about just following some of the others to the gate where I'll just wait for Vince and Frank. My plans are interrupted when I see the Baron is beckoning me with his paw while the O'Connors stare at me. Oh shit. I freeze, unsure of what to do. I'm very much not prepared for this. I should have left sooner. What the hell was I thinking? It's not like I can just ignore this now. So I walk over, slow and awkward, feeling anxiety overtake me. I hear Vince speak to the girl. Hey, Shannon, uh, why don't we take a short walk together? I saw something cool the other day I wanted to tell you about. She nods dejectedly, and the two take their leave. The Baron adjusts his glasses and, at last, at last introduces me. 
Sarah, Sarah, Daniel, this is Nick Saunders. I am very sorry for your loss. Sarah and her son regard me silently for several tense seconds. Then, to my surprise, the former gives me a slight smile. Thank you so much for coming, Nick. That was very nice of you. Michael would have appreciated it. I... Yes, of, of course, ma'am. Must be looking very dim right now, being so tongue-tied. The Baron opens his muzzle as if he intends to speak, but seems to reconsider. His expression is neutral, but I can still feel the weight of his gaze on me. It's as if he's telling me not to fuck it up. Oh, boy. Danny! <laughs> Danny suddenly speaks up, his voice low, almost a growl. Show it to me! Daniel! The bracelet! I grip my teeth. I can tell Sarah's about to say something again, but I decide I should go do this. I should do this. Fumbling to roll up my sleeve, I reveal the reddish band on my wrist. Huh. This is the first time I've seen it out in the sun, and it looks much more vibrant in the light. I had this, it had this dull color while I was indoors, and now not so much. There's a brief moment of silence, and Danny's muzzle contorts into an expression of rage. That's not yours. Take it off right now. He takes a step toward me, and despite myself, I cringe away. The badger may be a couple years younger, but his height and physique are imposing. Daniel, stop this sec- stop right this second! The tall badger rounds on his mother. It's mine, and he has no right to it! How can you- Tim, dear, would you please escort Daniel back to the car? I'd like a moment with Nick. The Baron nods, putting a paw on Danny's shoulder and pushing him to the path leading to the gates. Come on, kiddo! Despite his continuing protest, Daniel is led away. Frank, who stood at my side during the entire exchange, follows him, as does Unbound. I'm left alone with Templar's wife. I shuffle from one football to the other. I am very sorry, Mrs. O'Connor. Your son is right. Sarah frowns for a moment, before smiling warmly at me again. You're not the one who should be apologizing, dear. I'm sure Daniel is just upset. I don't mean him, although my son owes you an apology for his behavior just now. I blink at her, not quite following what she's saying. Her smile fades, and she sighs with, a, with obvious exhaustion. You said I've never been put in this situation in the first place. I am so very sorry any of this is happening to you. I open my mouth, then realize I don't know what to say and close my and close it. I didn't expect this at all, and I thought she'd be as angry as Danny, rightfully so. Would you mind walking with me a little? Y yes, ma'am, of course. We wander down the paved path between the rows of graves scattered in the grass. Sarah goes in the opposite direction from the gate. I'm reluctant to follow. Even with the chill, even with the chill, I feel stuffy and suffocated in my suit. A bird, maybe a crow, makes a noise somewhere nearby, hiding between the gravestones, perhaps. Can you... can you tell me what you saw that day? I skid to a stop. For a moment, I consider telling her that I'd, that I'd much rather not. But I see a plea in her eyes that I can't just refuse. So I do as she asks. I tell her what happened, never going into the details of the fight. How brutal it was, how viciously that wolf attacked her husband. The blows that shattered his armor and rained down on his exposed flesh. She doesn't need to hear any of that. I'll just let it flash in front of my eyes while I stare at my feet the whole time I'm talking. When I look up, her eyes are full of tears. I I'm sorry, Mrs. O'Connor. I, I didn't mean to upset you. She shakes her head. No, no, everything is alright. Thank you, Nick. I'm sorry. She wipes her eyes with a handkerchief I offer letting out another sigh. It's so strange to see that bracelet on someone else. She stares off into the distance somewhere, but not for long, as her gaze snaps back to me. This is all incredibly unfair to you. I can't help but feel angry at myself and Michael. H how do you mean? Why would you be angry? Because he did this to you. You shouldn't, Mrs. O'Connor. He was a hero. I know, and I'll always be proud of who he was. Which doesn't change the fact that he had no right to inflict this burden on you. It was my decision to keep the bracelet, she nods. You were very brave. Not really. No, Nick, I mean it. After what you saw. Oh, Michael, I'd smack you if you were standing here right now. But please don't say that, Mrs. O'Connor. I'm sure he did what he did for a reason. Yes, I think so, too. And I suspect I know why. I... We had been talking lately. I was so anxious about, about having Danny inherit his power. He disagreed, of course, but maybe not as much as I thought. It's such a dangerous thing, but... And when he met you, someone the bracelet would accept. My heart sinks. W what is she saying? The Templar gave me the bracelet so his son wouldn't have to put it himself put himself into danger? 
Because Mrs. O'Connor was worried about what it would mean for their son? No, that's... Sarah must have noticed how much her words have unsettled me. Because she puts a paw on my elbow. I flinch. I'm so sorry, Nick. If it's because of what I said to Michael, you shouldn't have done this, even if... Even if part of me... Even if part of me is relieved. Because Daniel won't have to put himself in danger? She nods, her eyes brimming with tears again. I feel a little numb. I... I understand. Even so, I won't blame you. I won't blame me if you blame you if you. No, no, Mrs. O'Connor. I already decided. Even if what you said is true, I'm not going to change my mind now. <clears throat> Ooh, excuse me, guys. Ooh, excuse me again. Oh goodness. I can't ask you to do that. It's so selfish and unfair. Danny has been, Danny has been training for this. My husband did a lot to prepare him. To then turn around and foist it upon an innocent bystander. It's all right. I, I understand. Really, don't worry about it. She sniffles into the handkerchief, giving me a long, searching look. I meet her eyes this time. Thank you. Don't mention it. We turn around and head back, silent for the moment. As we approach the gate, I spot the Baron's white fur peeking over the stone wall surrounding the cemetery. Damn, he's tall. Sarah taps me on the shoulder. Listen, Nick, if there's anything you need, don't hesitate to reach out, you hear? Michael asked a great deal, and it's only right for me to be there for you. If you need to talk, or if you are in trouble and need a safe place, whatever it is, call me, or pay me a visit. I... Thank you, Mrs. O'Connor. I'm grateful for that, and I'll keep it in mind. She takes my phone to type, her no to type in her number and address before we part ways. Over by his car, Vince is chatting with a female calico cat. Frank is standing near them, not participating in the conversation himself. I signal him to wait and instead head toward the rat. He acknowledges my approach with a nod. You have my number, right? You could have warned me that you were going to tell Mrs. O'Connor about me. I wasn't about to hide what happened from them. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that I shouldn't have been blindsided by this. I assumed a champ or the fox would warn you. I only mentioned it because I asked first. The rat works his jaw, no doubt coming up with some caustic response. I stare him down. Alright, you have a point there. Now, can we move on to more important matters? Grinding my teeth, I begrudgingly nodded his question. Did... how did it go with Sarah? Fine. I can tell he's waiting for me to elaborate, but when I don't, he just rolls his eyes. He then looks around as if to confirm nobody's close enough to overhear us. None of this is fine, but alright. There's something else that we would that we will need to deal with sooner or later. The director of Spec is here. You don't want to talk to him, but you might as well now. The director of what? Superpowered Persons Engagement Commission. He's our liaison with the federal government. Okay, cool, but why would I want to talk to him? The Baron, Mara, the Baron narrows his eyes. Haven't bothered to read the Cape Act? It hadn't occurred to me. No, was I supposed to? Yes, memorize it. Anyway, if you intend to be a superhero, the head of the commission will need to learn your identity. <laughs> yeah, right. This isn't negotiable, raccoon. You're either registered with Spec or you're a vigilante, and Templar, Templar is not a goddamn outlaw. I run my fingers through the fur on my forehead. This is certainly a change of pace from the funeral. I'd be more annoyed with the rat right now for telling me, for not telling me much sooner if I didn't know that the team had been too preoccupied with Templar's death to think of all this. It's a hell of a shitty thing to have sprung on you like this, though. Ugh! Fine! The Baron points out a tall husky, who I now notice had been speaking with Mrs. O'Connor just moments ago. As the badgers drive off, the dog turns to see us approaching. He looks older than the Baron, maybe around the same age as Templar had been. The American flag pinned on his lapel catches the sun, blinding me for a brief moment. This is Gregory Johnson, director of the Superpowered Persons Engagement Commission. Greg, this is Nick Saunders. He's... the new Templar. Uh, hi? Oh. The husky beams at me in that open and friendly manner dogs often do. He offers me a paw to shake. I hesitate only a second before taking it. Good to meet you, Nick. Surprised Tim let it happen. Been bugging him for days now. I give the Baron a puzzled look. Guess he even he respects my privacy enough to not, to not out me to the freaking government willy-nilly. Didn't extend the same courtesy regarding the O'Connors, but at least they had a right to know. Yes, well, he hadn't decided until recently. Right. Anyway, uh, is there more to whatever this is? Heh. <laughs> Some bureaucracy. But you don't need to worry about that stuff right now. Your identity will be secure, of course. Only a select few have access to such information. 
We take our hero's safety very seriously. Great! I'll handle all that on Nick's behalf, Greg. Just figured a quick introduction was in order. Of course, of course. And I'll be in touch soon, on this and other matters. If you don't mind, can Nick and I have a moment? Uh-oh, again? I can't tell if the Baron is surprised by the request. What is surprising, however, is that he looks, at t looks to me for a reply. Uh, sure. The rat nods and walks off. First of all, Nick, I must commend you on behalf of the federal government for deciding to take up this mantle. Hmm, should I politely indicate that I couldn't care less what the federal government thinks? This Gregory's starting to remind me of the military, the military recruiter. I'm gonna pause it right there. Alright guys, that's been another episode of Supernova. Super Fang's Path. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and leave a super thanks if you can. It always helps. Until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!